to decide yourself what are the rules of your fasting is like Adam and Eve in the garden telling God after God has told them do not touch that particular fruit and they show up and they say well in fact I don't quite crave for that fruit I crave more for the fruit next to it so instead of doing what you told me to do I am going to eat that fruit that you've forbidden me to eat but I am going to be a very good faster and I'm going to abstain from eating three other fruits that I have chosen for myself now I don't think that this scenario would end up with a very positive result for Adam Eve and ourselves as the um, children, spiritual children. Hello, my dear ones. I pray you are all safe and healthy wherever you are. We are recording in the chapel today because it's getting very windy outside and it's quite dark as well. But in the chapel is all right. Um, everyone is all right at the monastery. By the grace of God and through your prayers, thank you so much for your prayers. And thank you also for your support, your continuous support that makes it possible for us to be here and to keep on praying and to keep on working. Today I want to talk to you, but very briefly, about fasting. This will only be an introductory video about fasting. Why do we fast? How do we fast? what is the meaning of fasting and so on and then based on the comments you will leave to this video we shall continue with a few other brief videos in the future over the weeks to come christmas is coming so we have to start preparing for the great feast and before the great feast we have 40 days of fasting fasting in its proper meaning, in the um, spiritual, religious meaning of the word, has nothing to do with a diet. I think that's something very important that needs to be clarified. This is not about keeping your body healthy. In some ways, it's quite the opposite. So, the fasting of someone who keeps a diet in order to look better or in order to be healthier is not the fasting that we are talking about and it's not the fasting that the saints or the church has been talking about for 2000 years that's one thing that needs to be absolutely clear from the very beginning the other thing which is equally important is that fasting can only be based on obedience fasting is not something that we we willingly give up in order to sacrifice something for the Lord. Fasting has to do with obeying someone else's rules. If fasting is not based on obedience, then again it is not the sort of fasting that God requires or expects of us. To fast outside the rules of the church, to fast outside the tradition of the church, to pretty much come up with your own rules, is in some ways just the opposite of what fasting is all about. And the fathers have advised against that for centuries now. Let's try to talk for about a minute about what do I mean by that? What do I mean when I say that fasting has to be essentially an act of obedience and that it has to be founded on humility? Be warned that today I've brought the uh, sayings of the Desert Fathers with me because my memory is just so bad. I remember their teachings, I remember their words, but I definitely do not remember who said what. So today I've, I've brought the book with me, one of the, I think, six or seven versions that we have, and um, I will try to quote from them. Look, for instance, at what Ama Syncritica, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, that's the way you would pronounce the name in English. 
Alma Sinkritika is one of the holy mothers of the desert. And look what she's saying. She says, there is an ascetical struggle, there is a type of fasting which is planned by the demons. And the disciples of this practice do not know that they are serving the demons rather than God by doing it. Therefore, how can we discern between ascetical struggles that are pleasing to God, fasting that is pleasing to God, and ascetical struggles that are pleasing to the demons? And she says, obviously, the answer is the good measure. When she says, when the fathers and the mothers talk about a good measure, they actually imply discernment. Live all your life according to the rules of fasting. And then she goes on to say, do not fast for four days and then try to eat a lot. Or do not fast for a week or a month and then try to... She's just giving all sorts of bad examples of how not to fast. But the rule for her is live your entire life according to the rules of fasting. Now, of course, unless you are orthodox, you are going to say, well, whose rules? And uh, the only answer is the rules of the fathers, the rules of the church, the rules of tradition. The worst, the most negative, detrimental rule for us to follow when we fast, or indeed when we do anything in our spiritual life, is our own rule. Just think about it. It's not, it's not difficult to see it if you just allow your eyes to see it and your ears to hear this. If you follow a rule of fasting which is imposed upon you by someone else, by someone from the outside, in this case the church, which is non-personal and which has 2,000 years of good experiences and bad experiences to draw upon, if you follow that rule of fasting, then you are in obedience to the church. You are in obedience to those fathers and mothers who've struggled in those 2,000 years before you. And that safeguards you against pride. On the other hand, if you follow your own rule, even if you starve yourself to death, you are going to do exactly what Mother Simplitica is saying. You are serving the demon of pride. Because you have selected the rule for yourself. And it really doesn't matter what you sacrifice. It really doesn't matter how extreme your fasting or your prayer or whatever it is, because underneath it all is the poison of pride. You are building on poison. You are building on sand which will be taken away from underneath your foot, underneath your feet as soon, as soon as the demon has an opportunity. The only safe way to do anything in the spiritual life, and this applies particularly to fasting, is by obeying to the rules of the church. That takes away all the pleasure in fasting, that takes away all the self-satisfaction, that self-fulfillment of, oh, I have decided that I am going to sacrifice this because this is what I feel is the best thing to do. That is an ode to pride, a hymn to the demon of pride. To decide yourself what are the rules of your fasting is like Adam and Eve in the garden telling God, after God has told them, do not touch that particular fruit. And they show up and they say, well, in fact, I don't quite crave for that fruit. I crave more for the fruit next to it. So instead of doing what you told me to do, I am going to eat that fruit that you've forbidden me to eat, but I am going to be a very good faster and I'm going to abstain from eating three other fruits that I have chosen for myself. 
Now, I don't think that this scenario would end up with a very positive result for Adam, Eve, and ourselves as the um, children, spiritual children. From the very beginning, fasting and obedience have gone hand in hand. Adam and Eve are not abstaining or they are not supposed to abstain from that particular tree because they decided to do so. God tells them to do so. It is an act of obedience on their side to God's commandment. So fasting and obedience go again hand in hand from the very beginning. Adam and Eve do not get to choose the tree that they are not supposed to eat from. They are being told precisely which is that forbidden tree. And also from the very beginning, if you pay attention how the snake, how the devil approaches them, you'll see pride immediately. The devil doesn't tell them, oh, Unless you eat from that tree, something absolutely horrible will happen to you. He's not trying to frighten them. He's not trying to approach them in any other way except by means of pride. God forbade you from eating from that tree. Because if you eat from that tree, you are going to be like God. In other words, translating it in the words that Adam heard and that all of us hear, if you eat from that tree, you will become like God. And there it is, the poison of pride. And we all know what happened when obedience to God was broken and Adam and Eve decided for themselves how to approach fasting. This is why the fathers and the mothers of the desert speak about a type of fasting which in fact is pleasing not to God, but to the devils. In fact, the danger of this is so great that there are other stories, as for instance, St. Zanon, I've marked the story here. Hear this. There is a story that in one of the villages around the desert, there lived a man who fasted very frequently. And people appreciated and admired him so much that he was called the Faster. Now, when Ava Zanon heard of the Faster, he called him to come and visit. The Faster was very pleased that the old man called him, and he went into the desert. Once they were alone in the Abba's cell, the Abba just sat down and continued with his daily work and his daily prayer. Having no one around with whom to speak and having no one around to admire his ascetical struggle, the faster very soon fell into despondency. And in a matter of hour, he pleaded with the old man, Please pray for me, Holy Father, because I need to go home. To which Abba Zenon answered, Why? And the faster responded, I don't know what is happening, but since I entered your cell, my heart burns inside. In my village, I could fast for a day or two or three, and this never happened to me. To which the old man, the desert father, answered, This is because in the village you were feeding yourself not through your mouth, but through your ears. And by that, he means you are feeding yourself through the feeling of satisfaction and self-admiration that one has when other people speak highly of ourselves. Go home, he advised the faster. Eat once a day like everyone else, and everything you do above that, do without no one else knowing. If fasting is cut away from obedience, it no longer serves God, it no longer pleases God, it pleases the demons. To the point that 
The damage that this sort of fasting can do to us is so great that the fathers tell us to stop our fasting. There is another striking story from Abba Isidore, the priest, that warns against this danger of fasting which feeds one's pride rather than one's humility. And this is particularly striking because it does not apply to people who choose their own ways of fasting. This applies to people who do follow the rules, but because they follow the rules, because of their very obedience, they fall into pride. And so Abba Isidore, the priest, says, if you fast according to the rules of the church, do not fall into pride because you will be losing more than your fasting. It is better to eat meat than to fall into pride because you are fasting according to the rules. It is more useful for a monk to eat meat than to fast according to the rules and to fall into pride. And mind you, the idea of a monastic eating meat in the desert in the 300s, 400s, was something absolutely unthinkable. And yet he says not that it is safer, but that it is more useful for a monastic to eat meat than to fast according to the rules and fall into pride. What does he mean by it is more useful? He means precisely what we've been trying to understand since we started this video, that fasting is just a tool. And the purpose of fasting is to strengthen our obedience to God, while at the same time feeding, strengthening our humility. A monastic that fasts according to the rules and then feels very pleased about himself, or then is spoken very highly of by people who see him following the rules, a monastic doing that is in danger of falling into pride, and then his fasting, instead of serving him and being pleasing to God, does him a great disservice and is pleasing to demons, not God. A monastic who, on the other hand, for whatever reason, is forced to eat meat, because he knows how long, how difficult, how far he's fallen from what a monastic should do and what the behavior of a monastic should be, that monastic has a better chance of feeding his humility. And therefore, non-fasting, breaking the fast, serves him better than actually keeping the fast. The point of fasting is that it strengthens our obedience to God and that it feeds our humility. If you notice, or if your spiritual father notices, that fasting does not do that, then it is better for you to stop fasting. And indeed, it is better for you to publicly eat non-fasting foods. Sometimes... If you fast and you feel very good about yourself, oh, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, uh, I am now a saint, any minute now I'm going to float on a cloud. If that happens in the background, if you notice any sign of this demon, of this poison in yourself, confess it immediately and fight it any way you can. This is why in the Orthodox tradition we have the wonderful, wonderful traditions of the fools for Christ. People who, in the middle of Lent or in the fasting period before Christmas, on a Wednesday or a Friday outside a major fasting period, would go in the public markets eating a sausage. The minute that they felt pride entering their conscience, they fought it any possible way because they understood that fasting is merely a tool. And through this tool, you need to feed your obedience and your humility. 
if you take away this foundation of obedience and humility, if your fasting is not built on these two and does not feed these two, then your fasting is not fasting according to the wisdom of the church and it is not a fasting that is pleasing to God and it most definitely is not a fasting that serves or benefits your spiritual life in any way. This is why we do not choose our own rules when it comes to fasting. This is why we humbly bow down to the wisdom of those fathers and mothers who have struggled before us for 2,000 years, whose collective wisdom has been gathered, tried, selected and put before us in these collections of pure wisdom by the Church. And in obeying to them, we do what Adam and Eve should have done in Eden. We allow God, through the voice of his church, to tell us how to fast, when to fast, for how long to fast, and so on. We do not get to pick the tree or the fruit that we are supposed to abstain from, just like Adam and Eve did not have a choice in Eden. They were told precisely which tree is off limits. I wanted to tell you more today, but I think we'll just wait and see what your comments and reactions are, and then we'll see what is more useful for you. I think that is a better, more productive, more useful way of recording these videos. Be blessed, dear ones, and keep me and keep our monastery in your prayers. Slowly, slowly, day after day, we shall survive this difficult period, and at the end of it all, may we get to see not the world we saw before, but a much better, healthier, more pleasing to God world. Be blessed, dear ones. Amen, amen, amen.